transformative at the time. Um, how much is the legacy of that about the language that you found to write that book? Well, you know, what's happened since then, of course, is a kind of huge explosion of Indian writing in English um, and of all of many, many different kinds. Um, you know, science fiction, romance, thrillers, uh, you know, popular fiction, literary fiction, there's a real spectrum now, which there never used to be. I mean, there obviously were wonderful Indian writers in English uh, you know, before Midnight's Children, and, uh, and many of them were writers I admired a lot, like Anita Desai and, and, and uh, G. V. Desani and uh, Mokraj Anand and uh, R.K. Narayan and Khushwan Singh and so on. But I wasn't sure if English would survive as a literary language in India. You know, I, I, in the aftermath of independence, I thought it was entirely possible that Indian languages would assume a central role and that English would kind of dwindle. You know? and, and I think what even I hadn't understood was the extent to which English has become an Indian language. You know? and, and, and that there is an Indian English in the way that there is an American English, or actually several American Englishes, um, or a Caribbean English, uh, you know, or an Australian English, that, an Irish English, you know, and and so I was able to to try and enter that door, you know, to try and write the kind of English that Indian people speak, you know, and and um, that I think changed something, you know, and I think it, it gave a lot of people confidence to do the like to do likewise, you know, and and. Uh, so I mean, I'm kind of proud of that book having served that purpose. I mean, it's 40 years is a long time. It's kind of amazing that people still read it. It's extraordinary. Um, and it speaks so much to how it resonates and so much to how, what it meant and continues to mean to generations of readers. And I was picking up my copy and kind of flipping through it and, and remembering what appealed to me the first time I read to it. And it was so much about a post-colonial moment, right? About a moment in which a nation state is reconciling its past, its colonial past and trying to understand its identity. And in some ways that's what's happening in the West now. In so many ways now with the Black Lives Matter movement, we have the reckoning of a colonial legacy. I'm here in London, you know, the statues of slave traders were being torn down. Yes. I just wanna get, maybe I'm stretching a little bit here, but, but do you see its relevance playing out today as well? Is, it, is that why it continues to appeal to people? I mean, I hope so. You know, it's, it's very hard to know why people read a book. You know, I'm just, I'm happy that they do. But one of the things that's interesting to me is that I remember when it came out, all those, all that back in 1981, it was a very popular, it was especially popular amongst younger readers. You know, it, had, it had a big success in universities and things like that. And if there were people who didn't get it, they tended to be older, more conservative readers. You know? and, and what is interesting to me is that that's still true. You know, that even now, its readership tends to, to be younger, you know, um, and uh, that's something I think is kind of wonderful. People who were not born when the book was, was published, you know, still, and I think it's because it does talk about things which are not just universal, but, but as you say, versions of those things are still going on. Uh, I mean, I remember being quite shocked. I have two sons who went through the English school system and they were not given one lesson of education about the British Empire, not a single lesson, you know. Um, so the most important fact about the history of the UK, which is, which is its colonial history, was simply not taught at all. And as a result, nobody understands it, you know, and, and, and people walking around London have no idea what those statues represent or indeed why there are all these black and brown people wandering around the streets. You know? I, where do they come from? Well, the reason they're there is because you went to their countries you know, um, and, and you know, took all their money. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think of course it's, of co I mean, I hope that it's, it, it still speaks to people's contemporary concerns, you know, and I think that's one reason why a book survives. It's so interesting you're bringing up the education system because I, obviously I'm American, but I've lived here for five years and I've started to cover, of course, race relations in this country and the Black Lives Matter movement here in the UK and you bridging all of these worlds, right? Between America, the UK, India, and you're watching this very global reckoning sort of play out in different ways. I, I would love to hear your perspective because as an American, I feel like it's a constant learning process to understand 
sort of the world of, of the racial understanding in a post-colonial world in Europe is so different than it is in the United States. Yeah, well, one, you know, one of the things I, I mean, of course, the experience of India and, and the UK and America is, is, is quite different in many ways, you know, and, and it, it would be lazy to make too easy comparisons between them. Um, but there are things I think that are in common, which is what I think is that in all three countries, um, fairly unscrupulous leaders invented a fiction about the past in order to justify actions in the present. So, so in, in, you know, the Narendra Modi regime in India invented this golden age of India, which, were, which was a Hindu India before, you know, unpleasant invaders of a different religion came in and ruined everything. And if only you could just get back to that golden Hindu age, everything would be fine. Uh, in England, the same kind of golden age idea was, was used to justify the Brexit campaign, that there, that there was a wonderful moment before all these foreigners showed up when, when England was a happy place. You know, and, and we could all go back to that if we could just get rid of the inconvenient foreigners. You know. uh, and, and in America, you know, the people wearing the red hat, I, I, I always wanted to ask them, when was it that America was so great that we should try and return to it? You know, what was the date? I mean, was it, you know, when there was still slavery? Was it before women had the vote? Um, was it before the civil rights movement? Was it when homosexuality was still illegal? What was the, you know, when exactly is it that you want to get back to? Uh, because of course, the thing about the golden age myth is that it is a myth. There never was a golden age, you know, uh, but it can be used to justify pretty unpleasant policies in the present day. And I think that's something that varying forms of that seem to be happening in all three places. And you really try to explore this um, in one of your latest books, of course, Kichat. Thank mm -hmm. you for naming the main character after me, Salma, even spelled the same way. <laughs> it's my name minus one letter. <laughs> um, but I think what's extraordinary about that book is for so, for so long uh, as an author, you have played with reality and fiction and blurring those lines. What happens when that's the real world, when, when, when non-truths are being presented as truths? How, how do you tackle that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, th it's a thing that I think a, a lot of us have been thinking about and talking about, you know, that, that question of what does it mean? What is fiction in an age of lies? You know, um, and, um, and actually, I think there's a, the, one of the best answers. I'm going to paraphrase. Margaret Atwood wrote a piece about this. And, and, um, and well, to put it in my own words, what she was trying to say is that fiction and lies are in many ways the opposite, because the purpose of lies is to obscure the truth. And the purpose of fiction in a certain way is to reveal the truth. It's to talk about truths about human nature and what we're like and what we do to each other and how things are and what the world is like. You know, a, a good novel is always, it doesn't matter what its form is. It can be a fantasy novel or a realistic, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the point is that it's trying to tell the truth about human beings and, and, and how we function and how we deal with each other you know, and why we do what we do. Um, so fiction is a way, is a journey towards the truth, you know, and the lie is a journey away from the truth. So in some ways, although they appear to be related, they're actually in some ways opposite of each other. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think about my writing as a way of, as my way of trying to say something truthful about, about the world I'm in, you know, and, um, the tool, you can use all kinds of tools. You can use, you know, magic realism or kitchen sink naturalism or, or science fiction or, and I, over the course of my life, used all of that, you know. Um, and, and I think the thing is the tools you use depend on the, depend on the story you have to tell, you know, but, but, but the purpose is always the same. The purpose is always the truth. And, and I think, you know, maybe that's something fiction can actually offer people in, in a time like this, that you know, what happens when you like a book, when you read a book that you're liking, you know, is that you and the, read, the writer and the reader between them make a sort of agreement that this is, that this is what things are like. You, know, that you, you say to yourself when you're reading a book you like, yeah, this is how it is. You know? and, 
and maybe we need books to tell us how it is again, you know? And um, well, that's, that's, I'm slightly, it's slightly a kind of selfish argument because it's what I do for a living. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot to that. But you, it is something, of course, you, you do in your writing, but you've also carried this into the real world um, with your work in PEN America and your work to fight for freedom of expression. Um, but this, in this current moment, I think that this is now it's not just about freedom of expression, it's about a multiplicity of voices, right? Yes. Um, I, I want to hear how, how you see that struggle, how you're fighting for those different voices to come into play. Well, I think there the these are sometimes people think of the these things, free expression and and if you like, who gets to speak, um, as not being the same thing, you know. Um, but, uh, and, and that some people would even argue that the, 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 the classic free expression position is some, in some way a, a problem for a kind of diversity of voices. You know, and I, I never thought that really. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at the history of censorship, in countries where speech is limited, it's always minorities who suffer first. You know, it, it's always, every single time. Um, the person whose speech is suppressed first is, is a member of some kind of minority. And a kind of majoritarian view uh, becomes authoritative and everything else is marginalized. You know? so, uh, so the argument in favor of free expression is also the argument in favor of non-majoritarian expression. You know? um, and and yeah, of course, it's very important that that voices get to speak which historically have been uh, found it very difficult to speak, you know, very, very difficult to find a platform from which to speak. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. You know, and, and I think in an organization like Penn, one of the reasons I like it is that it doesn't choose between those jobs, you know, that, 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 uh, that bo both of those things are part of the work of, of, a, of, a, of a speech organization, you know, which is what Penn essentially is. I mean, it's a writer's organization, but it fights on behalf of, first of all, it fights for literature, it fights for the reading of books and the propagation of books and the survival of libraries and the teaching of books in schools and et cetera. Um, also, you know, things like getting books into prisons um, and into communities where it's actually quite hard for books, for books to reach. So uh, all of that is part of the job. And then there's the job of fighting for writers who are in trouble. You know, and and, and uh, speaking as somebody who's been a writer in trouble, I, I know how important it is to feel that there are people fighting for you. you know, it, it just makes an enormous difference uh, when you feel yourself uh, persecuted or harassed to feel that there's somebody on your side. Uh, and I mean, Penn has an amazing record of getting people out of jail, you know, and, and, I mean, around the world um, by highlighting their cases. And one of the ways I like to put this is that, you know, one of the things about dictators is that apart from being dictators, they, they want to be popular. They want, they, they want people to like them. <laughs> and so if you highlight things they're doing which are not popular, it's like putting a writer in jail. Sometimes it's actually easier for them to let the writer out rather than be made to look unpopular. Uh, and we've had this success in, in all kinds of countries where you wouldn't believe that those, those dictators would be responsive to that kind of pressure, but they are. So there's that. And then there's, there are these other larger issues. So, you know, and I think one of the things that's become very interesting in Penn in the, I mean, I'm no longer, I was president of Penn a while ago. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer officially, you know, I'm no longer an official of the organization, which I used to be. But I like it that now they are making an enormous effort to, to diversify their presentations and, and who is invited to speak and what subjects are discussed and, and uh, they, take, they have taken it on board in a big way, you know, and, and I think uh, good for them and, and everybody needs, publishing companies need to think hard about this. I think, I think publishing companies are thinking hard about this, you know, I mean, they need to think harder, frankly, you know, because we're by no means there yet. Uh, I mean, even Hollywood is beginning to think about this, but Hollywood will be last in the line, you know, um, because it's a, the, the machinery of the film industry moves very slowly. 
and and the kind of uh, it's received ideas of the film industry change very slowly. Um, uh, I mean, they are changing, as you see, even from from something as absolutely tedious as the Oscars. Uh, you know, you, you saw a sort of change in terms of who who is up for the Oscar, who's getting the Oscar. It's it's even in the last three or four years, it's become different. And ever since the notorious year of Oscars so white, um, it, it's kind of improved. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, but it's, um, as I say, I don't really see a conflict between the free speech position and the diversity position. I think in many ways, they're the same thing. And if I could be so bold to ask your advice, because you're talking about the changes that you've seen in your own industry, the changes that have happened in PEN America. I know that many of us here, of course, journalists are looking for changes in our own industry, in our own companies, in our own networks. What advice do you have for people who come from a diverse background or who might feel some sort of exclusion and they want to they want to fight back on that? They want to bring more voices, which I'm sure so many people here are. Well, you know, I, I, I've never worked in television, um, and I, I understand the, the hierarchies and the and, and the difficulties. Of, uh, um, but I think you know what we what it's always been one of the ways in which non-white people have had to make their way in a white culture is to be twice as good as them. You know? And and, um, and I mean, this is true also of women. You know, that for women to to rise, they have to be infinitely superior to the men and still not get paid as well. Um, but I mean, that's one way. One way is just to be better than them. You know, not that difficult actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, otherwise structures have to change and that's, that's very hard. You know, uh, and I wouldn't pretend to know how to change the structure of television news organizations. But I guess that's what this current moment is, right? I, I, I completely hear what you're saying because I grew up an immigrant in the United States and, and that was sort of the idea, just work twice as hard, put your head down and don't draw any attention. <laughs> and oh, you might get there in the end, right? <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I've in my time drawn quite a lot of attention. <laughs> that's true, that's true. You do it better than me. But we have this moment now where a whole generation is saying, well, no, why should I work twice as hard? Why should I put my head down and, and not speak loudly? How do you see this murder of George Floyd and you see all of this happening? People take, did it surprise you? Uh, did it seem, oh, well, that's about time? I, I would love to hear your reaction. No, I mean, I, I, I'm actually quite optimistic about this young generation. You know, I, think, I do think that, as you say, they're not willing to put up with it anymore. You know? and, and that's the first step to a revolution. You know? uh, and, and it seems to me that, that you guys have a chance of doing something, you know, just because of your going in position, you know, which is maybe different than it was when I was your age. You know? um, and so, I, yeah, I mean, I think there's a real chance of social change coming from, because of a pressure from from below upwards, from the young towards the older people. Um, if there's something I worry about, it's it's a, a willingness amongst just, I guess, some people to, we're talking about increasing the number of voices that speak, you know, that, that there's a willingness among some people to say that certain kinds of voices should be restricted because they don't like them. You know? uh, and and my, view, my view about the free speech position is this, that you, it's relatively easy to believe in the free speech of people that you agree with, you know, or, or, or indeed of people that you're indifferent to, you know, what, what they say makes no difference to you. you know, um, when people start saying things that you really dislike, you really dislike, you know, that's when you discover if you believe in free speech or not. You know, um, it's very tough because to be able to tolerate people who you find intolerable, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. And there are limits to this, you know, I mean, one of the great limits to this is Nazism, because um, what happened in Germany in the period of the rise of Nazism is that because of a free speech position, they were allowed to speak. And because of a kind of belief in, in, in liberal democracy, they were allowed to run for election. And, and yet when they won the election, they abolished the democracy that brought them to power. So, um, so I think, if there's a limiting point, it's that you 
cannot be tolerant of people who wish to be intolerant. You know, so, uh, people who, if they came to power, would destroy the very tolerance that brought them to power. You know, um, and so, and you know, different countries, different, even in the Western democracies, different countries draw the line in different places. You know? So, so for example, you're sitting in London. I mean, when, when I, I mean, I lived in London for a long time. And in London, as you know, there's a thing called the Race Relations Act. And the Race Relations Act makes it illegal uh, to make racist remarks. You know, and, and if you do, you can be prosecuted and, and you, know, you can be fined or jailed. And, and, and for a long time, when I lived in England, I thought that was just fine. You know, I thought I don't, I don't see any problem with that. You know, um, and coming to live in now, I've been in, in America for what, 21 years or something now. And, and so I've had to think a lot about the First Amendment because the First Amendment draws the line in a different place, that it, that it, it permits speech, which the Race Relations Act would forbid. Um, and and I had to think about what did I think about that? You know, who's right and who's wrong about that? Uh, and it seems to me in the end that I'm closer to the First Amendment position because to be frank, I want to know where the bastards are. <laughs> you know, I, 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 if people speak, then I know what they, what they think and I know who needs opposing and who needs destroying and etc. cetera. Um, also, I think there's a great problem of denying speech, uh, which is that it makes, it can, it can give the banned speech a kind of glamour, you know? Um, I mean, taboo is very glamorous. You know, when things go underground because they're not allowed to be spoken above ground, you know, they, they can become more powerful, not less powerful. You know? um, and, and, you know, it's like what people say about vampires that they shrivel up in the light of day, you know? Uh, and, and, and I would sooner have the daylight, you know, I'd sooner have the daylight to say, oh, that's who you are, you know, and, and that's where you are, you know? So, but it's, I mean, it's a very tough decision because it, it often means tolerating dreadful speech, you know, speech which any ordinary civilized human being would find unple deeply unpleasant. Um, but there we are, you see, free speech is not a tea party, you know, it's a fight. Absolutely. And it's so interesting you bring up the difference because I've, since moving here, I often hear that phrase racism doesn't exist, which I think is a very particularly uh, British sort of, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it, but it, it's an outcome of exactly what you're saying, this refusal to speak. I have, a, I have a mentor who once said to me, I like my racism served hot. I want to know what you're saying and what you said, and I want to be able to point it out. But that's also changing because we're understanding race as something beyond the allegation of racism, as, as a lived experience. Yeah. And sort of sitting with your books yesterday, I was thinking, well, you, you were doing the lived experience thing before it was a catchphrase, <laughs> before it was something everybody was saying. Um, and this is such a difficult time for people like us to share our lived experience journalistically, to cover the lived experience and to continue to, to be journalist. And, and I just wanted to know, how do you tackle it? How do you find that voice? Well, I think you do it by doing it, you know, you do it by doing exactly what you're doing, you know, and, and you, you hammer on the, on, the, on the door until it falls down, you know, um, and, and I think actually, I know somewhat more about the world of literature than, than journalism, but in the world, let's say of American literature right now, it seems to me the most interesting work is being done by two, by two groups. One is by black American writers, and the other is by, by writers from relatively recent immigrant communities you know so so you know you have writers like uh, i don't know min jin lee and viet tan nguyen um, and uh, uh, you know for, i mean that's to say you've got writers from from china from vietnam you have jumpa lahiri from 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 south asia you have junot diaz from the caribbean you have um, you know writers from everywhere whose whose lives have now become american lives and whose work while being, while being still true to its origins, its roots, is also American work. So it's actually changing the nature of American understanding. You know, it's changing the nature of American literature because American literature was always to a degree inspired by immigration. You know, but, but it used to be the case that the immigration was for very specific kinds. It was either Eastern European, uh, largely but not, not only Jewish immigration, but Eastern European immigration or Southern European, Italian, 
immigration and to some degree Hispanic immigration coming up from South America and Central America. But now there are migrants from everywhere in the world expressing themselves, you know, and, and, and that is really changing things. And I also think the incredible generation of black writers that there is right now in America are really taking charge of American literature in all different forms. You know, you have novelists like Jasmine Ward or poets like Tracy K. Smith and Natasha Trethewey or, you know, nonfiction and fiction writers like ta Coates. Um, and really this is the, the main thrust of American literature right now, you know, and, and I don't actually see work being done by white American writers that is half as interesting as that, you know. Um, so, so it's happening, it's happening that the, you know, change is coming. I'm going to ask everyone in the audience to please put questions. I'll start um, putting those questions out at uh, 40 past. So please put your questions in the chat box if you have anything. Um, Mr. Rajit, you said the word revolution. You said change is coming. Um, you paint a very optimistic picture. It brings me joy um, because I think after a year since the murder of George Floyd, a lot of us are feeling a backlash, a very violent backlash. Um, of course, we had the horrific shootings in Atlanta um, against Asian Americans. We've seen so many attacks recently. How do we stay optimistic? How do we keep a smile on our face and, and keep doing the work? I, mean, I agree with you. It's, this is, in many ways, this is a very frightening time in America, you know, um, and uh, it's frightening in terms of actual physical violence, uh, as you say, towards um, Asian Americans, towards black Americans. Um, and it's frightening at a political level because of one political party apparently abandoning the principles of democracy. Um, and it seems to me right now, there's only one democratic party in America and it's called the Democratic Party. <laughs> and the Republican Party seems to have very largely abandoned uh, the base ideas of democracy, one of which involves accepting that you lose an election. Um, uh, everybody loses sometimes, you know, uh, but to refuse to accept that you've lost it, you accuse the other person of cheating when you've actually quite emphatically lost, is first of all childish. You know, I mean, it's like the behavior of a bad tempered kid in a school playground, you know, taking his ball back. Uh, but of course, it's extraordinarily dangerous to the structure of liberty in this country, uh, and and um, and not just for you know not just for uh, black or uh, Asian communities for everybody, you know? uh, and so I do think it's dangerous. I mean, if there's what I do, what I think is that beneath that, there is a change taking place in this country, which is first of all ethnic. That's to say, within. I can't remember how, what the figure is, 10 or 15 years from now, this will be a minority white country. Uh, and that, that ethnic minorities put together will outnumber uh, the white population. That's part of why they're scared. It's, it's, I mean, it's part of the reason for the white supremacist you know, position is that they're scared of losing the natural right to rule and to impose their worldview, which they've taken for granted. And the other is, demographic, which is the people are moving into the cities and suburbs and out of the rural areas. And there's a lot of evidence that when people move in that way, their politics become more liberal you know, and, and uh, they become more progressive in their, in their thinking. And that's, that's what's happened in places like Virginia. Uh, and, and that's a, tr a continuing trend. So I think a lot of the Republican nonsense at the moment is driven by fear of losing their grip on the country. Uh, and which they are, you know, and, and um, it doesn't mean that they're not going to fight like crazy and that they aren't extremely dangerous because they are. But there's more of us than there are of them. That's a good place. That's a good place to leave us. I, I, I love the optimism and the positivity because I think we all need a little bit of that, um, especially after, after so many tough months. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move a little bit now to India. I know you grew up in Bombay and, 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 and that's a place that's very dear to your heart. Yes, but you've is. also been very outspoken about the changes in India and that it's not the same India of Midnight's children. And now we're looking at, at something very horrible that's happening there with the COVID crisis. I mean, the pictures of people lining up for oxygen, literally trying to resuscitate their family members in the streets. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know everyone has seen these pictures. 
I just want to ask you how you're how you're doing. How are you processing it? How how do you see it? It's just you know, how it's impacting the community. All of us who are Indian by origin, you know, we've been spending, I think, quite a lot of every day trying to be in touch with uh, with people in India to see what's going on, and and you know, people I know are losing people every day. You know, and, and it's it's a it's a just a colossal calamity, and 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 to a large extent, it it it, it has been, it's an avoidable calamity. You know, and and as it was here, as it was in America. That, that it, that I'm not saying it was completely avoidable, but it could be the effects of it could have been enormously reduced. Uh, in India, it, a lot of it had to do with overconfidence. You know, a lot of it had to do with this announcement only, whatever it was a couple of months ago, that, that, that you know, COVID has been vanquished. Um, and so everybody could go back to, I mean, things like Kummela, where sort of millions of people gather in no distancing at all. And, and that's now been established to have been a colossal super spreader event. Um, the fact that the, even the government has been holding gigantic rallies, um, uh, which also act as spreader events. And then just the intrinsic difficulties of India where people are so poor that it's very hard to have the kind of privacy required to socially distance. You know? um, once the thing starts spreading, there's, it, it's very hard to, to, to stop it. But again, the, refuse, the, 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 the incompetence of not having to hand the supplies required to help people. You know? I mean, to see this extraordinary headline, India runs out of oxygen. Sure. I mean, that's like a science fiction headline. <laughs> um, and yet it's just literally true. Uh, the government there had tried to say that one of the reasons for the, for the, for the surge was, was vaccine hesitancy, as it's now being called, you know, people reluctant to take them. But actually, there's no vaccine to take. You know, the, the country doesn't have any vaccine. I, I was talking yesterday to a friend of mine um, in, in Bombay who said that she had been trying to get online uh, to the government website to, to get a vaccination. And first of all, the vaccine, the, the website kept crashing. And, and when she got on the website, she was told that the, there would be no vaccine available at least until June. Wow. You know, and, uh, and so that's, what, that's, that's why people are getting sick. It's because there is no way to help them. You know? And okay, so now the international community seems to have be getting its act together. And, uh, and, you know, there's oxygen going in and there's, now we read today that both the British and the Americans seem willing to, to destroy the patents on, on, the, uh, on, the vac on the vaccines, which means that they can be mass produced at very low price. And of course, you know, big pharma is not in favor of that because what happens to their billions, um, but it's necessary and I hope will happen soon. And, but I mean, I, you know, I really think that the government there, as here in America, bears a great responsibility for, for a lot of the deaths. And there's so much happening there that you covered in terms of the inequalities you're talking about. You're talking about the micro level within India, the inequality there, the lack of governance, but also the macro level of the global structures of inequality that we're looking at. Um, I know that we have a few links for anybody who wants to help out. We're gonna put those links in the chat. So if you wanna donate, if you wanna help with the India crisis, those links will be there. Um, I, I know everybody's seen those pictures and will wanna help. I know I'm supposed to take questions, but I have to ask you about your latest that's coming out at the end of the month, uh, Languages of Truth. Could you please give us a little sneak peek of what we can expect? Well, what it is, is it's the stuff I've been writing um, for, apart from fiction, apart from novels and stories. Um, it's the, it's, yeah, there it is. Um, it's, it's, the, it's stuff that I've been writing over the course of the last 15, 15 16 years, um, which are essays on, on literature, on on uh, on thought, on politics, uh, it's the whole it's the whole range of what what goes on in my head, really. You know, um, and uh, there are there are particular essays about particular writers and visual artists, um, ranging from Amrita Shergill in in India to Kurt Vonnegut in America, uh, and there's a, there's a particularly in the first part of the book. There's sort of 90 pages or so which containing essays which really I think have 
in which I've really tried to express what I think about storytelling and the art of the novel and why and why I write the way I write and, and where that writing comes from, what what ancient mythologies, what classical th literatures, what's the source material of, of my work, but also why is it that storytelling is so important and so powerful, you know? Um, so it does all that. And it, 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 there's a whole section which deals with, you were talking about my work with pens, so there's a whole section about that. Um, and at the, at the very end, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a longish essay about the pandemic because, you know, I got in early. I, I, I actually got the coronavirus right at the beginning um, in, in um, I guess, March of last year. Uh, I mean, right when nobody knew how to behave safely, you know, frankly. Um, and so right at the beginning, and I mean, I was, you know, I mean, it, I feel every day more and more that I was very lucky, you know, um, because I didn't have the worst of it. I didn't have to be hospitalized. Uh, it didn't affect my breathing. You know, I mean, I had a fever, I had a cough, I had weakness, I had all those other things, but I didn't have to be hospitalized. But it meant that I, I experienced this thing from the inside and, you know, really it's no fun. I mean, uh, I survived, as we know, millions have not. Um, and so I wanted to write about a personal experience of living through it you know, and, and, and of the city that I live in living through it. What was it like to be in New York at that time? What was the city like? What was it going through? You know? um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a wide ranging book about all this stuff. You know, it's, it's, this is, as I sometimes say, this is the nonsense in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're all storytellers at the end of the day at, at our best, or we hope to be. Yes. Um, so Languages of Truth, I, that comes out at the end of the month. And I know there's an Amazon link there for everybody. Um, I'm sure we'll all be ordering it. Thank you for telling me all about it. So I'm going to start with the audience questions. Yes. Um, let's just start at the top here from Sabrina. Do you have recommendations for young writers who are looking to pursue a financially sustainable literary career? Even though publishing is opening up its doors to more diverse groups, it seems class is a big barrier and most literary voices are from financially privileged backgrounds. This is something, of course, you were just speaking about with me. How can we increase representation and make literature a financially sustainable path for new voices? You know, the truth is, it's always been very hard for writers to make money. Uh, I mean, this. And I think if you put it like this, if you, if you want to make money, it's the wrong job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, for, for every writer who, who manages that, there are uh, 10,000 who don't you know, uh, and, and who have to find other ways of supplementing their income. I and mean, one of the reasons why you find so many writers teaching in the academy is because of that, how to pay the bills, you know? Uh, and, and for a long time, I had to, to, you know, I worked as an advertising copywriter when, when, I, when I was starting out. I was writing dog food commercials, <laughs> uh, and, and you do whatever the hell you have to do. You know, you just. Uh, I, I think uh, most writers will tell you that the business, that the the business of becoming self-sufficient, it's really not easy. You know, there are very, very few writers, very few writers, who who sort of get there right out of the, from the starting gate, you know? Uh, I mean, I remember meeting Zadie Smith before she'd published a book. Um, she, was, she was like scarily young, she was like 19 or something. Um, and, and, and she talked to me about wanting to be a writer and, and, and I said the thing I never say, which is because I was so impressed by her. I said, if you have something you want me to read, send, send, send it to me. And, and about a year later, she sent me a, a, a hundred or so page, 200 pages of what was going to be white teeth. And, wow. And, and, um, wow, so you got the early version of that. That's amazing. Uh, see, I, I'm responsible for Zeddy Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this. What <laughs> happened is, I was so, I mean, she was like 20 years old or something. I thought, <laughs> how can you be 20 years old and write like this? It's kind of impossible. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was very, very impressed. And so I called a literary agent that I knew. And you know, this is there was no internet, there was no email, there was no way of sending a PDF to somebody, you know. Um, and I, I said to this, this agent, I said, look, I've got this book here, and I'm gonna put it in a taxi and send it round to you. 
and I strongly suggest that you read it tonight and that you call this, this, this author tomorrow and, and take her on because if you don't do it, somebody else is gonna do it tomorrow afternoon. Wow. And so I sent this book around and, and this, the agent is, is still Zadie's agent today. And she, she, actually, she actually did what I said. She read it that night and she called Zadie in the morning and took her on. And five minutes later, the career of Zadie went boom, you know. Wow. Um, and so sometimes that happens, you know, but that's very, very exceptional. You know, um, mostly people get there by, by fighting their way there. You know, I mean, I, I started writing, I left university in the impossibly ancient moment of 1968. Um, and Midnight's Children was published in 1981. You know, for 12 and a half years, I didn't make a dime out of, out of writing. Um, I had to do everything else that it took in order, in order to pay the rent. Um, and 12 and a half years later, I had an overnight success. <laughs> and, and everybody said, gosh, you're lucky you, you, you know, you just came, just emerged and boom, you got a bestseller and you're, how do you do it? And the answer is it took me 12 and a half years. Wow. You know, so writers have to be, they have to really want to do it. To really want to That's do. the two things I heard from you from that as, as, as bits of advice. Mm-hmm. Believe in yourself, keep going, eat out of tuna cans for 12 and a half years if you have to. Yeah. And when you get there, champion the young people who are coming up next, right? Yeah. For sure. Um, so, so let's help each other, help the next generation, and also just keep believing in, in, in yourself along the way. Um, and along those lines, another question, you're a hero to a lot of us uh, with multiple identities. Thank you for your work, particularly imaginary homelands and her own in Satanic Verses. Um, would you really say that Satanic Verses could not be published today? I hope it would. You know, I mean, I, I, I do... I do think it's harder because there are pressures on pe- people now that there weren't so many, much, so many pressures of that kind then. But I think, you know, writers and publishers are a pretty stubborn breed. You know, uh, uh, if, if you want to say something, I would still hope that you would find somebody who is willing to publish it, if it's any good, you know? I mean, that, uh, uh, that's the always the test, is it any good? And of course, what that means can vary enormously, you know, because, because it not being any good can be an excuse to not publish something that actually should be published, you know, um, just because the publisher is scared of it. Um, and I hope it would still be published. I mean, the fact is that it's, it's in print in 43 languages, you know, uh, I mean, all over the world and it still sells. And I think one of the good things is now, you know, to an extent, it, it obviously its sales were driven by scandal um, and, and by, by, you know, by political uh, uh, events. Um, but now that's not the case. You know, I mean, now again, that, that book, I mean, came out in 1988. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, for, it's a long time ago. Now I think people read it because they're interested to read it. You know, and and so I remember, you know, my friend Martin Amos said, when all the trouble about that book began, he said he he said that I had vanished into the front page, you know, and 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 I had to spend a lot of my life trying to get back into the book pages. <laughs> so, but I think I finally made it. You know, so sort of reappeared in the book pages, um, and so now I think people read it because they're interested to read it. You know, and and some people love it, and some people don't like it, and 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 and. And some people are somewhere in between, and that's the ordinary life of a book, you know. That uh, and and I'm just pr- happy that we finally got to the point where it can have the ordinary life of a book. You know? um, the, its readers who like it like it, and its readers who don't like it don't have to finish it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's um, that was. Uh, that's quite an extraordinary life for a book to go from something that's judged literally by its cover um, Mm. that, you know, I got told you're never allowed to read it, which meant I had to read it. (laughs) And and now for it to actually be judged for it being a book rather than than, than just the cover of it, right? I mean, the thing Um, is the book has a lot, a lot, believe me, of appreciative Muslim readers. Oh, yes. You know, so so it's it's absolutely not the case that there's a kind of solid wedge, sort of army of people 
of Muslim background who hate it, you know, because that's I I know from I know from who reads my books and who writes to me about it and who shows up when I do read well when we did readings, you know, who who shows up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as I say, there are people who like it and there are people who won't like it, you know, and and that's okay, you know. Um, a lot of books that are unusual or maybe a little bit ahead of their time or whatever have that kind of divided reaction. You know, when, when, Flaubert, pub, when Flaubert published Madame Bovary, there were a lot of people in France who said that it was pornography. Um, I mean, of all books that Madame Bovary should be thought of as pornographic, um, but it was, and there was an attempt to ban it as pornography. And now there it is, the great classic of French literature. You know? um, <laughs> and so sometimes art divides, you know, art doesn't always unite people. It, it sometimes divides people. But this is why there are lots of different kinds of books in bookshops. You know, you go and find the writers you like. You know, if you don't like my stuff, read somebody else. Um, if you do like, my, well, I mean, I don't actually think that. I think you should read me anyway. But, but, um, but it's true that books are not there to please everybody. They're there to please the people who can respond to them. You know, uh, there we are. I think journalists can um, can relate to that. I think we always say, if everyone's unhappy, then you did your job. As long as all sides are angry at you, then you did a great job. <laughs> and I think um, you, you covered everyone fairly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, true. I'm going to go to the next question, which I find so interesting because I found you speaking about the education of your sons, particularly when it comes to British colonialism. You spoke about that. So we have a question from Ayusha Agrawal. Forgive me if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, asking about your education as an alumni of the Cathedral and John Connon School. Mm. What was your experience studying there after partition? Um, she, also, she also graduated there in 2017 and the majority of the history lessons were about the East India Company, Churchill, Mountbatten. What was the classroom education and general student life like there for you? Well, first of all, it was segregated. I mean, now Cathedral School, the boy and boys and girls schools are merged. Uh, but in those days they were separate, so the boys' school had no girls, and vice versa, and that was sort of weird to begin with. And and um, and yes, it's true that you know my generation is this strange generation of immediately after the independence of India, and for a long time, you know, the textbooks were still the ones that had been used in the colonial period. So, um, so there were people who would now be thought of as heroes of, of the resistance to the colonialism, like Tipu Sultan, for example, you know, who were presented as terrible villains. Um, and sometimes the teacher would say, you know, there's another way of thinking about this. But sometimes the, they, we would just be given that as that's, that's the, these are the facts. You know? And somewhere there in, in, the, in the late 50s, I guess, that began to change, the textbooks began to change, you know, and, and, and the way in which history was taught began to change. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a British school that was, that was started in India, as, as indeed most of the good private schools in Bombay are, you know, the, 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 the cathedral school and the others that, um, are, whose names I will not mention because I didn't go to them. <laughs> um, that's what there is. And I think they are, to an extent, still stuck in the past, you know. Um, but again, the change is come, the pressure is coming from the younger generation, which doesn't want to take it. And now there's another problem, which is the, the, the BJP, the kind of Hindutva movement, wants to rewrite history again to be very Hindu centric, you know, uh, and, and is doing that. It has a project of rewriting the history books in order to magnify Hindu history and minimize the, the contribution of, of Muslim civilization. You know? um, and so we have another problem now, you know, because I, mean, I think we've now reached the point of post post colonialism. <laughs> yes. So it, 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 it whole, <laughs> Going the other way. A whole new uh, bunch of problems. All these writing and rewriting of histories, it makes me think we always say journalism is the first draft of history. And I think it's never been 
a more diverse industry and a more vocal industry in terms of the backgrounds and different people it brings. And that means hopefully there won't be quite so much writing and rewriting required in the future. Well, I, teach, history. You know, I, I, I teach at, at the NYU Journalism School. Um, and one of the reasons I do that is because I think it's very important to, to interact with young journalists on the subject of how you tell the story of the world. You know, um, and I think one of the things that has developed in the last half century or so is, is a kind of journalism which started with, with new journalism, started with like Tom Wolfe and George Plimpton and Gaitelis and people like that, Lillian Ross. Um, and it has come up to the present day with writers like Svetlana Alexievich and, and so on, that, which uses the techniques of the novel, which uses, which uses high literary techniques but uses, uses those techniques to tell true stories. You know, and, and what happens to reality when you use novelistic techniques to tell those stories? You know, um, what is it, the question is, does it enable that, those stories to, to reach further into, into society or does it in some way falsify them? You know, that, uh, so again, given that we live right now every day on this bizarre frontier between truth and lies, you know, um, the question is about this kind of writing, which is some of the best writing being done in, in, in nonfiction right now, uh, this kind of narrative nonfiction, book length narrative nonfiction. Is that actually a net benefit? Is it a good thing or is it in some way a problem also? You know, and, and this is one of the things we've been discussing. I just taught my last class yesterday, so I'm, I'm demob happy now. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's an interesting, it's a really interesting subject. I think, how do you use the arts of, of literature and apply them to the real, you know, uh, apply them to what's actually happening? And does it make it, is it a better way of telling the truth? Um, and if so, who does it well and who does it badly? Mr. Rizdi, I could talk to you all day. I think we could all talk to you all day. I know we need to start wrapping up. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Malika and I just wanna remind everyone, link in chat for the new book and also for any aid to India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rashti and Salma. You are both brilliant. Um, I, before we go, I'd like to thank all the wonderful AAJ Atlanta volunteers who have worked tirelessly to make this event possible. Tina Kim, Kelly Yamanuchi, Arvind Temkar, Jane Kim, Ayushi Agarwal, Fenley Foxen, and Rahul Bali. Thank you all, and thank you guys for celebrating API Heritage Month with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rashti and Salma again, and uh, hopefully we can do this another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Thank you.